think that it was the radio speech. And now we should see that real quick. Left and right. So left and right, and this is the Oh. 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 So we see if it works. Thank you. Okay, all set. Okay, so um, I'll introduce our next speaker. So it's uh, Dr. Lenita Danelio, Danilo, um, and she's going to talk on similarity of anisotropic variable viscosity flows. Thank you very much for the introduction. I thank you very much the organizers for uh, allowing me to present uh, this work. So uh, uh, this work uh, is being performed in collaboration with uh, my uh, postdoc now, Mikhail Gauding. Uh, he is a former PhD student of Professor Norbert Peters, uh, who was present at the last edition of the, uh, of the meeting here. And we started to collaborate on, uh, on this subject. And we established a European, or we wrote a proposed European proposal. And uh, suddenly, uh, he passed away one year after that, so two, two years ago. So I, uh, I dedicate a part of uh, this presentation and part of this work to the memory of Professor Norbert Peters. Uh, the other people who contributed are uh, my students, uh, Lea Wavnel, uh, Nurdin Tagelmint, and my colleague, Emilian Varia. So this is a part of a larger question that is an appraisal and prediction of variable viscosity flows, which theory? You'll see that if things look relatively uh, simple for uh, classical flows, where things are much more complicated for uh, variable viscosity flows. Uh, this is the outline of the presentation. So I'll start with the importance of variable viscosity flows with only two short examples. I'll continue with the morphology and phenomenology, two examples from our previous studies performed in my group. Uh, on, uh, and especially I'll uh, look at the round jet, spatially evolving round jet, experimentally studied, and a temporal mixing layer that is numerically uh, studied. And then I'll go to the core of the subject, which is a self-similarity. And I will mainly address here uh, the question with uh, the tool of the two-point statistics. And for the pedagogical reasons, I will first present some results in the classical flow, so with the constant viscosity, and then I'll go to the variable viscosity flows, and some results in this spatially evolving variable viscosity jet. And then I will uh, conclude. Uh, the importance of uh, the flow stands in the fact that many practical applications uh, are connected with a variable viscosity. And I should say that uh, a lot of attention is being according to a variable density flows, but much less importance is according to uh, a variable viscosity flows. So to understand which is the effect of uh, variations of the viscosity, we'll uh, concentrate on flows in which the density is matched and only uh, viscosity gradients are present or viscosity variations are present. So here you have have three examples. This is a fluid that comes in an ambient fluid at the same viscosity. So this is a classical jet. You see with the classical structures that are developed. The second example is the same fluid that issues in an environment which is 20 times more viscous. So it, both of them are density matched. So all this structure, modification of the structures, are due to variations of the viscosity. So you see that the morphology of the flow is very, very different with these uh, mushroom-like uh, structures. And the last image is the same fluid that comes in an environment which is 40 times more viscous, and the morphology of the fluid is even more different with uh, kind of pancakes, structures, and even regions on the center of the jet which are completely unmixed. <laughs> 
another example that I chose for uh, today is uh, comes from uh, geophysical applications, and these are fountains of magma on the bottom of the ocean, and uh, what which are the questions that we are interested in is and the shape of the mixing at the edges of that and the distance at which this impinging jet will uh, be able to go. I'll go to uh, some examples that uh, uh, were studied in uh, my group uh, for a few years now. So these are images obtained with uh, planar laser-induced fluorescence. And at the left, you have a constant viscosity jet in which you mix here nitrogen with nitrogen. And at right, you, you have a propane which issues in an environment which is with nitrogen. So I should state that the nitrogen is 3.5 times more viscous than the propane. So it is the example here is a variable viscosity jet with the ratio of the viscosity of an ambient fluid through the viscosity of the core jet equal to 3.5. So it is not very large. Of course, earlier we had ratio of the viscosities that are much more important. However, we will see here differences. The initial condition is the same. Here we see the classical kelvin helmholtz vortices, and at right, we have a hint of this large scale that will appear much earlier, but especially we see a mixing at scales that are distributed over a much wider range, and the transition towards turbulence is uh, much uh, enhanced, and it appears uh, much uh, earlier. The physical interpretation that we offer of that is that because of three kinds of instabilities that are born at the edges, that are instabilities that are born because of the viscosity uh, variation, stratification, instabilities that are uh, associated to the jets, so kelvin helmholtz and sometimes, depending on the shape of uh, the injector, we have instabilities at the wake that is created here. So because of that, we have islands of viscous fluid that are enticed into the jet core, and this will create stagnation point that will stop the mean velocity, so the decay of the mean velocity will be much faster. The fluid will stop because it goes into something, an environment which is much more viscous. And lateral fluctuations were born, so the transition toward turbulence will uh, be uh, accelerated, will appear earlier, and the mixing will increase. These are images also obtained in our spatially evolving uh, jet with uh, planar laser-induced fluorescence. At uh, the left, we have the mean scalar field in a constant viscosity uh, flow, so it's nitrogen with nitrogen, and in a variable viscosity flow, propane with nitrogen. And at right, we have the RMS root mean square, so typical fluctuations of uh, the scalar field, constant viscosity and variable viscosity. So what we see for both of them at a larger potential core in a constant viscosity field, so the flow will go much further, and here it is a potential core that is much more reduced. And also, the maxima of the fluctuations that appear here that appear much earlier, very early in the very near field than uh, here in the constant viscosity that will appear uh, later. So once again, we have uh, uh, turbulence that will be uh, born uh, much earlier. Another example is a temporally mixing layer that is studied using DNS. So I chose not to give a lot of details here, but you have two streams one rapid and one uh, slower, with a variable viscosity, so and, and the rapid stream is less viscous than uh, that uh, which, is, uh, which is slower. So what you see that the evolution through the time of different quantities, here is the evolution of the mixing layer thickness, uh, defined like that, when the ratio of the viscosity increases so between the two streams, this uh, mixing layer thickness evolves much rapidly. So the mixing layer opens much more, and mixing is enhanced, and uh, also, uh, uh, all fluctuations are born earlier. This is uh, the profile of the mean velocity in our temporal evolving jet. So this is the rapid uh, stream at the low viscosity stream. This is the slow stream at the higher viscosity stream. And we see that when the ratio of the viscosity here the results go to up to a ratio of viscosity of nine, but we had the simulations at a higher ratio of the viscosity. So we see that, of course, the rapid stream is slowed down because of the whirl, viscous whirl, fluid world that is situated in uh, this uh, region, whereas uh, the slow one is, of course, accelerated. And much more differences we see when we represent the derivative of the mean velocity that is represented here. We looked in order to quantify which are the terms responsible of that. We uh, started from an Navier-Stokes equation, and we derived the transport equation for the mean velocity field in, here in a temporal uh, mixing layer. And of course, these are the classical terms, and these, all these uh, 
four terms are specific to the variable viscosity because we have viscosity der uh, derivatives, viscosity fluctuations, viscosity fluctuations and derivatives of that, uh, etc. The most important terms that appear, of course, is specific to the variable viscosity term is this in red. You see that is the most important. And this is uh, down to the fact that the rapid stream is at the lower viscosity, so we are in a counter gradient configuration. So this will contribute to the fact that the absolute value of the mean velocity will evolve much faster in time, so uh, the evolution will be enhanced. If we go now, we look uh, also for the temporal mixing layer to uh, the turbulent kinetic energy, and here these are the square the squares of the, uh, the, or the three uh, velocity components. And again, we represent that as a function of time. This curve corresponds to the ratio of viscosities of one, and it increases up to, I have here up to nine. And we see that the turbulent kinetic energy increases, so this validates and corresponds perfectly to what we have seen in the jet earlier, that uh, turbulence is enhanced and it appears much earlier. Uh, in order to correlate that to uh, the transport, the first principles and the transport equation that we re-derived that from the Navier-Stokes equation and we derived the transport equation for the total kinetic energy, we see classical terms that appear. This is the production term that's it's still the most important as a magnitude here, but in which the derivative of the uh, mean velocity is very enhanced because of the reason I have presented earlier, it, the, the profile of the mean velocity is modified because of the uh, viscous work that is situated nearby. And we have uh, supplementary terms, of course, the second and the third line that correspond and are specific to the variable viscosity terms. Here we have a production term, is positive here, that corresponds to the fact that blobs of fluids which are viscous that will correspond to a lower kinetic energy so that the, the, the production of that will be uh, a result of the uh, viscosity gradients. And he, this is an extra dissipation, so it is a negative term here, that will be due also to the viscosity gradients. So we have shown once again that turbulence fluctuations are born faster, mixing is increased, and the next question we are interested in in order to solve all these uh, equations and to have a prediction of how uh, mixing is evolving is do we have self-similarity? As you know, if, we, if, I, if I come back to a round jet, it is one of the flows that are self-similar. The Reynolds number, whatever is calculated there, lambda or et cetera, stays constant uh, along the axis of the jet. Is that the case, again, in a variable viscosity jet or a variable viscosity flows in a general? And we'll do that by uh, looking at the two-point statistics. And for pedagogical reasons, I'll just introduce some things for a constant viscosity, and of course, I'll go uh, immediately to the variable viscosity. This is the image of the cascade, as introduced by Richardson, et cetera, and Kolmogorov said that if the Reynolds number is sufficiently high, then all these small scales should be locally isotropic and uh, universal. And one way to understand what happens at the the scale is to consider increments, so differences of here U, but it can be any other turbulent flow, a turbulent field, between two points of the space separated by a distance R. So this is an increment or a scale. And we can calculate moments, so second order moments, third order moments, etc. The second order moment correspond to the energy at a scale R and all smaller scales. And of course, they are correlated, uh, they correspond to the spectra. The, sec the third order moment correspond to the energy flux at a scale R. And now, Kolmogorov said in, uh, he said several things in K41 that for K, uh, in, uh, in 1941, says the theory known as K41, that for sufficiently high Reynolds number, he introduced the similarity hypothesis, and this is the first similarity hypothesis that said that the end order moment of velocity increments, when they are appropriately normalized, that should be universal functions of a scale R appropriately uh, normalized with respect to the scale that is known as Kolmogorov scale and defined by that, by this uh, expression. Based, he derived that based on a phenomenological basis. And there is also the second similarity hypothesis that I will not take care in this uh, presentation that uh, deals with uh, the scales much larger or that's situated in the uh, inertial range if the Reynolds number allows that to exist. So I'll concentrate uh, the, the following of my presentation on two issues related to the first similarity hypothesis, which are the functions f can that be invariant in 
when different parameters of the flow vary, space, time, Reynolds, etc. So when I change one parameter of the flow, if we normalize appropriately uh, the functions, do they stay similar? So do we have self-similarity? I recall that that is very important because when we go back to the equations having a solution, self-similar solution and self-similar transport equation, it is much easier to be tackled analytically and or numerically, etc. And which is the expression of the similarity scale? Because Kolmogorov provided the expression, but that was uh, uh, based on a phenomenological basis. Another thing that Kolmogorov did in 41 in another paper is he derived his equation so uh, from Nagy Stokes, so from the first principles. This is uh, known as the fourth, fifth uh, law. So the third order moment are related to the second order moment, and this is the energy uh, transferred at any scale. If the Reynolds number is sufficiently high and if we place ourselves in the inertial range, then this reduces to the third order moment equal to four fifths mean energy dissipation rate and time the scale. Or what we have seen, for instance, with this result published in 2006, is that if we consider the maxima of these functions and we normalize appropriately, so by epsilon r, so we compare that with four fifths, we need Reynolds number as high as 1,000 here for forced turbulence and as high as 10,000 here for decaying turbulence, so very high Reynolds numbers, in order to have this constant four fifths uh, to, be, uh, to, be, uh, to be valid. So for most of the flows, these are experimental points that we had at that time, for most of the flows in laboratory or real flows, et cetera, the atmospheric boundary layer should be somewhere, somewhere here, are affected by the finite Reynolds number effects. And in order to solve this, we went back to the first uh, principles and we re-derived this uh, Kolmogorov equation or for the transport for the scalar, et cetera, et cetera, but by consider what we call the large scale terms or forcing terms here, that if we only represent these terms as a function of the scale r, these terms are not important at small scales, but they are more and more important at intermediate scales and a larger scale. So at large scales, this, uh, are this uh, forcing term that is associated actually to the shear or to decay, or if we are look at that uh, for the scalar for the mean temperature gradient, et cetera. So it's everything that is flow specific that will appear and will be represented in this uh, forcing term. So now we have the good tools Part of K41 was re-derived, and we, we have the good tools in order to apply that to real flows and the finite Reynolds number flows. And if I uh, advance now to uh, go to the similarity, the first similarity hypothesis that concerns uh, scales in the dissipative range and inertial range if the Reynolds number allows for that to exist. So by working on this transport equation, but completed by forcing at a large scale, we may apply the self-similarity analysis. The self-similarity say, once again, if we appropriately normalize all that, that these terms should stay similar, so should be the same when are uh, com uh, completely normalized. So one form of that is the equilibrium similarity as proposed by George 92 for spectra and by our group uh, later on for uh, structure functions, etc. And mathematically, they said that, for instance, for the second order structure function, that should be written as a shape function that depends on the scale normalized with respect to a characteristic length scale and a coefficient in front of that that will depend on uh, any parameter p that I put it in, uh, in red that can be the space, the time, but it can be also the energy injected in the flow, of, for instance, the Reynolds number. So when the Reynolds number increases, that this term may stay self-similar if we normalize with respect to uh, uh, adequate scales. Same thing for the third order moments and et cetera, all terms that will appear in the equations we are interested in. Now, this is a self-similarity that comes into play self-preservation as was introduced by Townsend in uh, uh, 56. And he understood by that a particular case of self-similarity when this parameter is only the space, for instance, x for a spatially evolving jet, or it can be the time. So it's when the, when the flow stays uh, self-preserving that uh, following an evolution in uh, space or time. Now, I, uh, we substitute these uh, functional forms in the scale-by-scale -scale transport, so these transport equations here. We choose as a, a normalization basis the dissipative term here. So we multiply by whatever will appear here, the scale RL divided by the square of the characteristic velocity and divided by the viscosity. So this will become a constant. And we'll 
uh, impose that each term, this is the equilibrium similarity, that each term should stay constant because one of the, the, the terms is constant, that all the other coefficients should, uh, should stay constant during this transformation. Kolmogorov was speaking about a fine transformation of the flow. So in, in, independently on the language we use, let's say that when we apply a modification of the flow, that all these things should stay self-similar. So we should have a real, real co coefficient in front of that. So this third order term that's, that represents the energy transfer, it will lead to the Reynolds number uh, built with the characteristic length scale and with the characteristic velocity scale and with the, of course, with the viscosity. Now I'm in the case with the constant viscosity that should be constant during the transformation. And this term will lead to a relationship between epsilon that is here, it is the energy transfer uh, uh, at the level the, of the uh, smallest scales, divided by the, vis the viscosity and multiplied by the square of the, uh, the scale and divided uh, again by the square of the velocity that should be constant. This is a system, these two terms, a system of two equations with two unknowns, the velocity and the scale. If we solve that, then the solution is the Kolmogorov scale. So this comes from the first principles and uh, from the transport equation here, Navier-Stokes. Moreover, if we impose that the characteristic velocity should be the variance, for instance, so that is characteristic of the larger scales, the characteristic length scale uh, can be identified with the Taylor, mi Taylor microscale, and you know the definition, so it can also be a solution, but the natural solution that uh, emerges is the Kolmogorov solution. If we, if we speak about a complete self-similarity or complete self-preservation that signifies that all scales will stay self-similar or self-preserving during the transformation, then all these scales are proportional. So eta, Kolmogorov scale, and the lambda, the, uh, the uh, Taylor micro scale, will uh, be proportional. All the other terms, the forcing term will lead to other constraints that will lead uh, us uh, to the conclusion on how the, the characteristic scale evolves uh, through the scales. And of course, this was validated by many studies, but maybe the most representative is that of the, the spectra normalized with respect to the Kolmogorov variables that do collapse over the uh, dissipative range and scales uh, or wave numbers here, uh, smaller and smaller, in conformity with the first similarity hypothesis. Now, this was for constant viscosity flows, but our issue is for variable viscosity flows and is self-similarity uh, valid or not? So we derived, it's appear, the details appear in all these papers, in two of these papers. Uh, we derived the transport equation for the total kinetic energy. This is a summation over I. So this is the total kinetic energy at a scale R. So this is the time derivative of the total derivative. This is uh, the diffusive term. This is the energy transferred at a scale. And note that this form of the equation takes into account anisotropy because this is a divergence term. And here we have the Laplacian term here. We are not yet developed as a function as in a spherical coordinates, for instance, which is the case when uh, isotropy is valid. So this is a very general form. We have divergence and Laplacian and et cetera. And anisotropic flows can be tackled with this tool. So this is a production term, et cetera. So all these blue terms are classical terms, but in which we have considered viscosity variations. So for instance here, note that for the diffusive term, we have the viscosity that is coupled with the total kinetic energy at the scale, uh, the, the wet scale. And all these red terms are specific to the viscosity, variable viscosity flows because we have gradients of the viscosity and uh, gradients, for instance, of the viscosity increment. So as soon as our flow is at a constant viscosity, all these terms go to zero and all these terms reduce finally to the form that we had for a classical flows. Uh, one of the aims uh, of us is to close this term because we have many, this is the classical term that is unclosed, but this is another term that is unclosed because we have the correlation between the viscosity and uh, the total kinetic energy. And at the higher order terms, we'll have other terms that will, be, uh, will have to be closed. So if we uh, succeed in closing all that, then we are, will be able to predict the kinetic energy, so uh, uh, how mixing is performed at each stage of the flow. Now, if I simplify a little bit the, uh, the things and I consider the central region of a round jet in which local homogeneity, I'm, I'm still in an anisotropic context, is considered, so I neglect some of the terms. So this is a little simplified uh, form of the equation. We have here a transport, a turbulent diffusion, a production, production or destruction 
uh, by viscosity gradients and the, and the dissipation. Note that the dissipation is defined by uh, mean uh, values of the viscosity times the square of the uh, velocity gradients. So for that, we apply our equilibrium similarity or self-similarity analysis, and we impose that all these functions should be uh, written as a product between a shape functions of psi, which is the scale normalized with respect to a characteristic length scale, and coefficients in front of that, and we reapply the exercise, then we have supplementary difficulties because we have this new term that is the total kinetic energy coupled with the viscosity of the two points. And this can be written as a reference viscosity at that position times a function that uh, we uh, can consider. And the new term that is very specific to our variable viscosity flow is that the decay over x of the viscosity, because we go in an environment which is more and more viscous, but it can be less and less viscous, but at, at variable viscosity. And of course, the decay over x of the total kinetic energy because in our jet that the kinetic energy decays. So that will be written as the de uh, derivative over x of the reference viscosity times the derivative of the kinetic energy and of a function times of the shape function here. And of course, we do the same thing for the viscosity. So a little bit of attention to this mixed term viscosity total kinetic energy that can be decomposed in a mean value of a reference viscosity and in the following, at least for now, we only consider this mean value, but we can also have a contributions from the fluctuating value of the reference viscosity. So if we replace all that and we do the same kind of exercises previously for the constant viscosity flow, Terms are the same except the viscosity was replaced by the reference viscosity because the viscosity varies and we have this new term which is specific to our flow because we have the decay of the reference viscosity and the, the x derivative of the kinetic energy. So it can be shown that, again, if we look specifically at the very small scales, the Kolmogorov scale naturally occurs, but the Kolmogorov scale that will be defined now with the variable viscosity epsilon, defined in a variable viscosity flow, and the viscosity that is a reference viscosity. So for now, I have only considered at that position in the flow the mean value of the uh, viscosity. It can be shown, of course, that if we, I look at larger scales, the Taylor microscale can be also uh, derived as a characteristic scale in which, again, I should take into account the reference viscosity in our flow and uh, uh, variable viscosity dissipation uh, as a reference that was considered. If the flow is completely self-preserving, then all scales are uh, proportional, of course, but for now we, don't, uh, we, we, we do not uh, have a clear evidence uh, for that. But we have a better insight on these slides. And if we suppose power laws now for the mean velocity for the characteristic uh, velocity, or a typical fluctuation of the velocity, and for the reference viscosity, and we consider that the mean velocity will decay at x to the minus n u, the typical velocity will decay at x to the minus n u, so this is a capital U, and the reference viscosity will vary at x to n nu, let's say n nu positive if we go in a more viscous uh, a more viscous environment. So if we replace all that in our systems of equations, and again, we put particular attention to this term here, which depends on the derivative of the uh, viscosity, then, and we combine all this, we obtain different constraints. And if we work on them, that this is a very important uh, result, that we can cover different scenarios. The first of one is with if n nu is equal to zero. So this corresponds to the fact that the viscosity does not vary. We are in the constant viscosity case, but of course, n u equal to one. So the mean velocity will decay as x to the minus one, which is a classical result in a constant viscosity jet. But if n nu different from zero, so if, if we have any variations, non-negligible variation of the reference viscosity, which was for us the mean value of the uh, viscosity, then if this coefficient, this exponent is uh, different from zero, then n u cannot be equal to zero, so we do not have a conservation of the jet momentum, so our uh, the classical things that are known for the jet are modified. Moreover, and I did not, I do not develop here, but uh, if we work also apply the same analysis to the transport equation of the scalar, so the mixing fraction that uh, will uh, produce the mixing in our, in our jet, in, in, and if we come back to the, our, our result in the Navier-Stokes, that we can show that the 
Reynolds number calculated with the characteristic velocity, characteristic scale, and the reference viscosity cannot be constant during the decay. So as soon as we have the viscosity variations, then the product between the velocity and the characteristic scale can be kept constant. And if the viscosity is constant, which is the case of the constant viscosity jet, then the Reynolds number will be constant, will be kept constant. But if the viscosity varies, this Reynolds number cannot be kept constant. So we conclude at this stage that self-similarity or self-preservation cannot be achieved in a variable viscosity jet, even if uh, the viscosity increases or decreases. Now, because we uh, pointed out this uh, pessimistic conclusion, so uh, the variable viscosity jet are not easy to be tackled. The difficulties are much more important than in the classical uh, jets. So life was not meant to be easy, as uh, one uh, Australian prime minister used to say. Uh, now we try to uh, test uh, a little bit and to, and to look at uh, different functions. So this is our uh, correlation between the viscosity and the second order moment here. And if we test that at uh, different diameters downstream, these are results from a PIV performed in our spatially evolving uh, jet, that we see that self-similarity at least for these things holds on the axis of, uh, of uh, the jet in which the mixing is relatively well performed. But if we go on the shear layer and on the borders of the jet, then these functions are, do not, uh, are, are not uh, similar. They do not have the same, uh, the same shape. Now, an important point was the closure of this term. Because remember, I used the reference viscosity that came from uh, uh, how we wrote this uh, term here. And I decomposed in the mean value times uh, the correlation between the fluctuating viscosity and the kinetic energy. And uh, we tried to, to see if the mean viscosity is sufficient to close all that. And uh, so we looked at the shape of this uh, mixed structure function and on the second order structure function. So the shapes are different, at least at large scales here, both in the central region of the jet or the axis of the jet and also in the shear layer where the difference is uh, more important. So the mean viscosity is not sufficient to reliably close this term. So we went more, we uh, looked at uh, 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 fluctuations of the viscosity, and here we consider the RMS of the viscosity times the second order structure functions as a closure. And this closure is much more so the, the ratio of these two functions is nearly constant over a range of scales that is more important. So this closure, which is not perfect, but is uh, much better than the mean value of the viscosity, is supported by experimental data. And the reference viscosity is even more complex than the mean viscosity. So the analysis can be performed again if we want uh, back to our analysis, but now the reference viscosity will be uh, will be this uh, fluctuator, so RMS of uh, the viscosity. So this signifies even more that self-similarity is not likely to occur in variable viscosity flows with large-scale viscosity gradients, because it is required that the mean value of the viscosity should be locally constant over the scales that are relevant for the flow at that position, but also that the RMS, so next order fluctuations of uh, the viscosity should be locally constant uh, that for uh, the similarity to be valid over that region of the space. So um, as, as a conclusion of that is uh, that self-similarity is uh, uh, much harder to be achieved in uh, variable viscosity flows. Now if I look at just a rapid uh, look at higher order moments transport, so this is the transport equation for the fourth order moments in which we have uh, the, this, uh, the, uh, uh, we have the, now the divergence of the term, but we have the fourth order moments here, production term that would be specific of the flow. Uh, again, the decay of the viscosity times the decay of the fourth order moment uh, here that can be decomposed, et cetera, but the dissipation, uh, the mean energy dissipation rate does not appear as such. We have the correlation between the second order structure functions and the dissipation. So things are much more complicated. We need a closure here for uh, this term. And for this case, I will have a talk on Wednesday afternoon, and I will develop that for a passive scalar and a little bit for an, act an active scalar. K41, so even the Kolmogorov scale is not, does not have the classical expression because it cannot be written as a function of epsilon. It, can, it should be written as a function of epsilon square here because this term will be developed at the square of uh, epsilon divided by uh, the adequate scales. So things are uh, even uh, much more uh, complex in, uh, in uh, variable viscosity. The last uh, result that we performed, and this is a work in progress, or everything is work in progress, but we performed a DNS uh, for homogeneous isotropic turbulence with variable viscosity. So now we went 
We want to go to a little bit simpler flows. So the flow is homogeneous isotropic uh, turbulence and we introduce uh, the viscosity variations at the scales that are much uh, smaller and we look at the correlation between the dissipation velocity gradients and uh, the viscosity. And uh, well, I'll skip the details of uh, the simulations. I'll just, these, these are uh, images, these are low viscosity in blue regions and high viscosity here and uh, during the transition the mixture, uh, the mixture field will be wrinkled and will be conv convoluted by vorticity so we'll have a mixing during the time in uh, flow which is homogeneous isotropic turbulence. And in this flow I recall that homogeneous decaying homogeneous isotropic uh, turbulence is not self-preserving because the Reynolds number decays simply. So very small scales can be locally, etc., but the Reynolds number decays. So this is basically a flow that is not self-preserving, and we show that, of course, variable viscosity will not be self-preserving. So this, uh, at the end, we have uh, results of all that. Uh, I will stop here. These are the structure functions we have obtained during the decay. Well, we show that in some way Taylor's postulate is uh, confirmed because the ratio of the viscosity stays, uh, that does not influence on the shape of the, of the functions when we appropriately normalize all that. But during the decay, the shape of that evolves, so we do not have a self-similarity, we do not have self-preservation in a variable viscosity flow. So as a conclusion, I, uh, I have shown that uh, uh, in uh, flows with uh, viscosity gradients or viscosity gradients, we, we go faster towards uh, turbulence, we mix faster. So things look to be simpler and it is better for uh, applications like uh, combustion and the questions from combustion people actually were uh, the, uh, the origin of this flow, of this, uh, all this study. Uh, but on the other way, uh, for things that are uh, more fundamental, etc. classical theory, uh, theories are little useful. So we have to redefine and to go back to the first principles and to redefine epsilon, to redefine the production, the correlation between the viscosity, etc. And especially if a f initial flow at a constant viscosity field is self-preserving, as is the case for a round jet, especially volume round jet, then the variable viscosity flow cannot be self-preserving or not completely self-preserving. It can be over distances uh, over the space, but not over large distances, because air lambda will evolve, will go in some environment which is more and more viscous. And other flows in which the basic flow is not self-preserving, but invariable viscosity will not be self-preserving uh, again. Thank you very much. <laughs>